This is Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida, giving the sermon January 12, 2014, at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, Fort Pierce, Florida. I want you to know it's uh, terrific to be here with you this morning. Uh, this is my third service, doing the 8 o'clock and then the 9.15, and then a brief meeting with candidates, and then to be here with you today. I was at this church a very, very long time ago, but as in like over 20 years ago, uh, because at that time I lived here in the diocese, I was involved in various things, but especially youth ministry in Crucio, and I can't honestly remember the occasion that brought me to St. Andrews, but it was with one of those things. So it's been a very long time, and it's terrific to be back we are celebrating an occasion this morning, two actually. One is the commitments that these are making to, or for confirmation, one to be received and one to be baptized, but also the event that in fact makes those commitments possible, and that is, as we celebrate today, the Feast of the Baptism of Jesus. Now, you need to know that I, as a preacher this morning, have a very specific kind of task. Um, it's not just to rehash the same old information. You see, isn't it true, especially if you've, been, if you've been in church for a while, that what happens is, is that you hear the gospel stories and the other scripture readings and the like, and perhaps even the hymns, as well played as they are, by the way, um, they kind of just go over your head. It becomes automatic. You don't actually see in any kind of fresh way what is, in fact, being communicated. Uh, I have a friend of mine who's a visual artist, a painter, and he tells a story that illustrates that. He was taking his son to go to the zoo, and they were about to go to the polar bear exhibit, and he said to his son, he said, now you need to know, notice the color of the fur on the polar bears. It's very, very white, and the reason it's very white is so that it's camouflage, so that they can blend in with the snow and the ice against predators. So his young son, about seven, was like, he was ready, you know? And so they walk into the polar bear exhibit, and it's all, of course, cold and frigid, and all of a sudden you hear this very loud voice saying, Dad, they're not white. They're actually yellowish. And my friend looked at the polar bears, and his son was exactly right that they, in fact, their fur is actually a kind of yellowish grayish color. It's not snow white at all, even though most of the visual representations that you and I have of polar bears does paint them, in fact, exactly bright, bright, bright. And my friend thought about that for a fact, and he said, here's what happens. If we see an image often enough, when we actually come in contact with the real thing, we are far more likely just to see the image that we remember rather than what is in fact right in front of our eyes. C.S. Lewis, uh, in a book called An Experiment in Criticism, in fact, makes the same point when he says that the first demand of any work of art makes upon us is to surrender ourselves to it. In other words, it is possible I've seen that, I've had this happen. To go in front of, to be in an art museum and see a very famous old masterwork, and especially if you've seen it in art books or in projections online or things like that, say for example the Mona Lisa, then you are far more likely to notice the things that those images capture, and in fact miss the other things that are there that actually make it the masterwork that it is. And Therefore, a part of what it means to actually appreciate what is in front of you, whether it be, and especially in the arts, whether you're talking about a painting or a piece of music that you have heard time and time again, is to take the discipline of trying to look, experience, hear it with fresh eyes and ears, to notice what you haven't noticed yet. And perhaps, like my friend, to have your image corrected by what the real thing shows you. Now, I want you to know, that is exactly how I come to the story of Jesus being baptized. 
I've seen, I, mean, I don't know how many countless representations of this, and I've heard the story virtually all of my life. And so to come at it in any way that is fresh requires of me to say, there is so much here, though. In fact, I don't know. So I need God for you to show me things that I haven't seen before, because I know they're there. My knowledge of it is, in fact, superficial. I need you to open my eyes. And what I began to see as I began to pray and to read and to study was exactly the very thing for which I had prayed. It, it doesn't always happen, you need to know. If you're a faithful Bible reader, sometimes you will understand that sometimes you read the text and it's like a banquet. There are other times when you read the text and it has no fresh meaning for you whatsoever. It's like, psh, it goes right over your head. Because there's, quite honestly, there's only so much we can take in. And sometimes we're ready for that which the scriptures desire to disclose to us. And sometimes we're not. What I begin to see, though, as I begin to read this passage, was first of all the astonishment of John. It is in the text. Remember, John is Jesus' first cousin. They know each other. This is not the first meeting that they have had. And in fact, because they are in some geographic proximity to each other, they probably met and talked and had conversations. John immediately, you see, recognizes, though, not merely the flesh of his first cousin, but he also accurately understands who he is. He is the Word made flesh. He is the God, man. Uh, a poet that I like very much by the name of Malcolm Wheaty, who is a British contemporary poet, says this about this encounter, and especially the voice that is spoken from heaven when Jesus is baptized. The voice that made the universe reveals to us the God in man who makes us new again. John is shocked that literally the God-man would come for baptism. Because you see, baptism in the Jewish tradition was not all that we expect it to be. It's actually different. There were only two groups of people who came for baptism in the Jewish tradition. One were Gentiles who wished to be baptized. And the baptism was a sign that they were leaving their old identity as Gentiles behind and taking on a new identity of being fully Jews. And they would get into the mikvah, this large container of water. And in that water being poured over them, they were literally having their old identity washed away. So that when they came out of the water by rabbinic command, they were no longer to be referred to, even in casual conversation, as, oh, you know Joel, who used to be a Gentile. No, from that moment on, he was considered by the entire community fully and completely a Jew. So clear was the understanding of this trans transformation that there were rabbinic writers who described this process as being we learned this from the Gospel of John, being born again. Jesus didn't make that phrase up. He just took it and did something very, very new to it. The other group of people, besides Gentiles who wished to be Jews, who were baptized, were those who were considered ritually or ceremonially unclean. If you read the book of Leviticus, there are several things that fall into that category, like touching dead bodies and things like that. And therefore, to have that deed washed away so that you could enter into the temple because this mikvah was actually outside in front of the entry into the temple in Jerusalem. You would go under the water and the impact of that bath was meant to represent the washing away of the impact of that unclean deed. Both of those things have profound and significant echoes in Christian baptism, but that's another sermon. So you can understand John's shock that the God-man, his first cousin, would come to him wanting to be baptized. He was not ceremonially unclean. 
He was not Gentile in ethnicity. There was, in fact, no need for him at any kind of objective level to be baptized at all. And John is so shocked by the idea. If you heard your rector John read it, he said, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? It's almost unfathomable for him. Because you see, the shock of John the Baptist's baptism for them was that he was declaring to the nation of Israel that because of their sin before God, they were both ceremonially, ceremonially unclean and were being treated by God as Gentiles. They were a people under judgment. He was calling them to repent, to give up an old way, and to come again into their covenant relationship with God. Jesus certainly didn't do that. But look at Jesus' response. And this is where it gets to you and me. But Jesus answered, it, answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper, meaning fitting, appropriate. This is under direction that I am doing this. For us, in this way, to do what? To fulfill all righteousness. Meaning, Jesus, fully righteous, was doing something that he did not need to do for himself, but to fulfill all, that's the operative word, all righteousness, means that he is doing it on behalf of the unrighteous. See, the, the, the key word is identification. In other words, Jesus, in his humanity, as the word made flesh, and it happens again and again and again. In fact, it's the whole purpose of his life to identify with all that humanity needed to do to be acceptable and right in the sight of God. And it's right here. That's what he's doing. Because you see, because we as a people, in fact, are outside of the covenant promises of God, do not belong there except by God's gracious and free gift. Jesus chooses to act on our behalf, that which we need to do, so as to make a way for us, so that Jesus can say to the Father, I've done all that is necessary for them to come clean and forgiven into my presence. As I began the sermon, Jesus, we thank you that you welcome us into your presence. On what basis? Is it our behavior? I don't know about you, but it's not on mine. I can think of a lot of reasons. That's why we have a confession as to why I need God's forgiveness to be able to get into His presence. But we're in His presence and it precedes anything that even remotely looks like a confession. Why is that even possible? Because you see, Jesus has already done all that is necessary in birth, life, baptism, death, resurrection from the dead, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave, opening the door for us to be able to freely come into His presence, and as we say yes to Him, and come under His authority, call Him Lord, and yield our life to Him, with that reservation. He says, yeah, you're one of mine, I've made the way for you to be here. Welcome. Welcome. You belong. That's what this whole service is about. It is a declaration that Jesus, in his great love and mercy, has said to us, I've paved the way. Will you come? Will you say yes? I've made room for you. You belong. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, you're forgiven. You can be received into the very household of God. So that you too can know the wonder of his promises that he is in us, with us, and will never let us go. And therefore, of course, God, I yield you my life. That's what we're doing in confirmation and in baptism. The covenant promises that they are making today are based on what Jesus has done. And they are willing and glad to say yes. The renewal of those promises that you and I will make, men who, and women who have been baptized, and perhaps, maybe not, perhaps confirmed. Also, we're renewing that covenant that we 
have said yes to. Because God is the one who first extends his love. And we, in response, say yes or no to him. And because we say yes, we freely and with great joy enter into this. So that's what we have done, that's what we are doing, and that's what we are about to do in this wondrous service of baptism and confirmation. I invite you not to look at the liturgy like my friend looked at the polar bears, but let it speak to you afresh. Discover the things that may surprise you because the commitments are significant. It takes great courage to say these things. It's profoundly countercultural. But to do so is to put yourself by God's invitation into the flow of God's grace and mercy. And I don't know about you, I'd rather be there than anywhere else. Because that is, in fact, the greatest place of mercy. And that's what I need. Mean. I need his mercy. So with that in mind, we are going to quickly move into the liturgy. But don't forget, there are new things in it. So that when the invitation comes for you to say, we will, you do so freshly, out of the bottom of your heart, knowing that it is God, not just your bishop, who is inviting you to take your place among the baptized, and the confirmed who have said yes boldly to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you that you have so identified with us, we who do not deserve such closeness, such care, such tenderness, attention to detail, that even in baptism, yield and submit, making a way for us to be received, to be adopted, to be taken in. Thank you for such grace and such deep, deep love. Give us all that we need to yield fully to such a gracious and kind invitation that we might, in every circumstances, but especially now, courageously, and joyfully say yes to you. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.